Great. Well, thank you very much and welcome everyone to today's CCC OER presentation on open educational practices uh, and how they support student-centered course design and accessibility. Uh, this is a topic of interest to me and I'm very happy to be here today uh, sharing the stage with our presenters. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, CCC OER is a Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources and uh, is an organization that has been instrumental in helping lead the uh, expansion of uh, open educational resources, open practices, and open sharing, uh, not only among community colleges uh, in the United States, but also among institutions worldwide. Um, and uh, I am very happy today to have uh, our two guest speakers uh, who are going to be discussing uh, different ways that uh, we can use uh, universal design uh, and open educational practices to uh, help with accessibility issues. Um, once we have an opportunity for our presenters to uh, share their information, we will certainly have opportunities for uh, you all to ask questions. So please, at any point in time, feel free to enter questions in the chat uh, and we will get to those questions uh, as best we can. Uh, today, our presenters include uh, Tara Bunyag, who is the Senior Instructional Designer at the University of the Pacific. Uh, and we also have Suzanne Joachim, who is the OER Coordinator and Biology Faculty Member at Butte Community College. As we discuss these issues, just keep in mind that this is something that fits very well with the mission of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, as we do seek to expand awareness and access to high quality OER uh, and support faculty choice, as well as improve student success. And there are lots of institutions who are active members of CCC OER. Uh, hopefully many of you are members of such institutions. If not, I would encourage you uh, to look more closely at CCC OER and uh, what the organization is able to offer, uh, but you can see that we have quite a large footprint throughout the United States and our footprint is growing uh, regularly. Uh, and so every time there's one of these webinars, it seems that there is a new pin on the map of the United States and that's something that we always like to see. So now I would like to um, bring in our speakers so that we can get right down into the topic of how open educational practices support student-centered uh, course design and accessibility. Uh, and I'm going to now turn this over to Tara. Uh, thank you very much, Tara. Thank you, Preston. My name is Tara Bunag, um, as you mentioned. I uh, am senior instructional designer here at University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. Um, we have three different campuses. Uh, it, of the university in Stockton, San Francisco, and Sacramento. Uh, I support all three campuses, but I am also a, a faculty member. I uh, was teaching um, educational statistics, you know, so graduate level courses last semester. Uh, and uh, I also support ADA and OER initiatives across the university. And Suzanne, did you? Sure, I can introduce myself. Uh, Suzanne Joaquin from Butte Community College in Northern California. Um, I am the OER coordinator here, and in my role as biology faculty, I've designed, um, I think, something near 20 some courses that have both been online, on site, um, at all different levels. And so that, that's kind of part of where, where my piece is coming from is, is um, how I've designed those in, in relation to some of the work I've done with, with equity and accessibility. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Sam. I'm going to go in straight into the to my presentation here. Um, so, open educational practice for for accessibility. Um, so, as an overview, we'll go over what some of the challenges were, the accessibility issues that I encountered, uh, why an OER approach actually and 
solving the issues, and how it helped to transition failure into success. So the challenge. I was, as I mentioned, teaching a graduate level uh, doctoral course in educational statistics. You know, so those of you that have an education background probably took this course at some time. Uh, if, uh, uh, but it's it's very intense. It's a highly visual course, um, but it needed to be delivered to a student who is blind. Uh, it's the course was in an independent study format, so it's hybrid modality, uh, very limited in person format less than two months before the semester. And although the existing textbook was good quality, it, I found out in July I would be teaching this course and it wouldn't be able to be converted into a accessible format until October. Um, the course was going to start in August and so that, that was simply not going to work. Uh, even if that it could be uh, converted, it wouldn't necessarily be converted in a way that was truly accessible to that student. So I decided to go with a, a different approach. So for that, the initiative, um, needed to make sure that I met the same objectives at the same level as other students, make sure that the materials are easily modifiable on the fly because um, had a very short timeline, so some of those things uh, wouldn't necessarily be fully uh, implemented and ready to go day one. Uh, I needed to make sure that there was immediate access to the content and non-visuals for everything visual. And I'll explain a little bit about why I specifically say non-visual as opposed to a specific format there. Uh, and the big challenge was this was a hybrid course. We met in person only once per month. That mean, meant that a lot of materials had to be created beforehand. And I didn't have a lot of time to be able to do trial and error. So I had to be able to, to adapt right away. So I started with the OpenStack statistics book. Um, it's, if, you're, if you've taught statistics, if, you've, if you're you know, really uh, familiar with OpenStax, I mean, this one's been around for a while. It's a good quality book. And it has some great features. So it's, there's a lot of different formats for it. It aligns to all the, the low level objectives that were in this graduate statistics course. Lots of examples. It's really accessible. Uh, the Creative Commons license allows for a lot of different modifications and it has a lot of different materials with it. But this was, you know, it's an introductory statistics book. Uh, it was very low level for the class that I was teaching. It's not education specific, so there's some topics that are missing. It doesn't include SPSS, whereas, you know, graduate level statistics course is going to include some SPSS. It didn't have the comprehensive data files that we needed to look at, and it was a very visual focus. So it's, it's a very good book, um, but there's, you know, this challenge of how do we take all of this visual content and make it not visual? So the before the class, I uh, went through and I modified all of the materials to make sure that they were in multiple digital formats. I uh, included a lot of different media, so taking and finding YouTube videos, um, identifying some critical visuals, so what visuals were going to need to be converted into something else. Uh, and also looking at how I might modify across the senses. So I think often when we think about uh, modifying materials that we find in open educational resources, we think of keeping it within that format. We change a visual into a different visual. We change the colors or we change the, the text to some have wording that's more like what we would say if we were writing it. But it's very easy to convert a we are between the senses. So uh, I'll show some examples uh, of what I did there. Um, and also, I made sure to do a lot of testing. So if you are doing work in accessibility, if you're doing accessibility design, so I'm not sure whether uh, you are, are designers, but if you are creating materials, getting NVDA, which is a, uh, a freely available screen reader, is really valuable. Can give you a really good idea of what the open educational resource that you're working with actually sounds like to somebody who's using a screen reader. And that is a 
it, it can be a really life-changing experience when you <laughs> listen to your materials using a screen reader. Also, a lot of um, hands-on testing. So I tested materials. I actually tested with other people that, you know, whoever I could get to stand still. Um, and, you know, just getting an idea of a, a wide range of different materials. Uh, so kind of the, the basic uh, principles behind universal design, which will be talked about in, the, this, in Suzanne's presentation. So digital materials, the most obvious. Um, I made all of the materials, so all of the content uh, into Canvas pages. Uh, I also did a PDF format with a table of contents and an MS Word document with the table of contents. Uh, once I had it, the materials in one format, it was very easy to, to switch between them. Um, and it ended up being a very, uh, very advantageous approach because I could actually provide the materials in a format that the student could inter interact with most, uh, most engagingly. And it allowed for, for changing things a little bit easier. So some of the other materials, so sample problems. So these came from the, so this sample problem came from the OpenStax statistics book. Uh, I also you know, found some sample problems on other open educational resources across, uh, that are they're available throughout the, uh, the internet. <laughs> I also uh, found a number of different YouTube videos, statistics tutorials, really some good materials out there. There's one of the advantages of, of so many people struggling with statistics is that there are so many different tutorials people have made about it. Uh, so this was, you know, an, an advantage for this. Uh, I have also, you know, Braille noted there. One of the big challenges with, with this is, okay, we can convert open educational resources to Braille. There's no problem doing that because we're, we have the, uh, the, the licensing that allows us to, to change formats, to, to revise these materials. But the problem is it takes, it can take a while to get things converted into Braille. Also, um, not all students who are blind actually can read Braille. Um, there's actually a very significant portion of the of students who are blind who, who don't read Braille. And even if they do read, read Braille, they don't all read the same form of Braille. Uh, before I'd started on this process, I didn't necessarily realize exactly how many different types of Braille there are or the challenges with um, the different languages and how you actually uh, convert mathematical concepts into Braille. Uh, so it's, it, that, was, that was a bit challenging. So we did make some materials that were in Braille, but it, they ended up not being very useful because it took so long and it, was, um, there wasn't, it wasn't easy to modify on the, on the fly. I also made some t other tactile materials. So for a tactile material, I would take a basic OER that I found. So some materials materials that were uh, either from the OpenStax book, other um, open educational materials that were out there, examples and samples that people had provided of statistical concepts, and then I would convert them into some sort of three-dimensional uh, representation. So the example that I have on the screen is a, a sheet of cardboard with um, puff paint. So if you are familiar with the old uh, 80s puff paint uh, it was used on t-shirts and sweatshirts to make all sorts of different designs. Some of it was, you know, glitter glue and different things, but it provides a raised surface uh, so that you can easily uh, distinguish the, the three-dimensional object. I used that in combination with pretty much everything that I could possibly find at a craft store. So I could actually start with any sort of OER and I could convert it into something three-dimensional very quickly. Um, the puff paint, unfortunately, takes a little while to dry, so that required a little bit more preparation than some of the other materials. Um, some of the other things that I used were um, sticky foam. So there's foam that has a sticky backing. Um, I used uh, sequins, I used uh, pipe cleaners, I used glue, I used, I used all sorts of different things to try and uh, uh, test it out. Um, and that's a, a, a actually kind of an interesting way of you know, taking OER and actually putting it into the physical realm, because we always think about OER as being just digital. 
And a lot of students do need that physical, even if it's, you know, just a printout or, uh, or other things. Um, also having students create these materials. So I did have uh, the student actually create some of the, some materials that, you know, I uh, can't share those ones with you, but um, the student was able to actually create some of these three-dimensional materials and then check the work. So some of these, uh, you know, it's it's a very good approach, I think, also for for students in general is, you know, how do you actually physicalize these concepts? Throughout, including relevant real world examples. So this is something that you know, we hear throughout the, the, the literature and throughout uh, pedagogical approaches is, how do we make this something that is targeted toward the student? Make choosing real world examples that are actually relevant to the to the students and that's where open educational resources really really shine you can pull in all sorts of different examples from uh, from the research from in this case um, an area that the student was interested in um, you can pull in uh, either you know real data or um, hypotheticals um, the framework for this case study on uh, uh, on um, on guide dogs is based off of a you know the actual um, time it takes to to train a, a a guide dog and then how long they actually have for uh, working life. And these were you know this was a a, a scenario that was suggested by the, the the student and then I was able to expand on find some of the data that actually went behind it and create a uh, some some data uh, some hypothetical data of what what a uh, study might actually look like um, this is these types of things it took a very short period of time for me to make them because the data is out there um, and it made it so much more engaging for the student uh, made a lot more interesting than just having the same statistics examples over and over which is you know something that is a challenge within within the statistics field is once you get particularly in educational statistics, we do lots and lots and lots of examples of exam scores, and that gets old. Um, so just having a little bit of a variety. Um, although, you know, things ended up being very successful overall, at the start it was not fully technically fully accessible. Um, some of the formatting that, you know, I'd initially done on my uh, uh, materials um, just it was technically accessible past all the accessibility checks and things but when it came to what the student could actually use it wasn't there, there were some issues there um, they were easy to fix but because I was working with open educational resources I was actually able to fix them as opposed to having to figure out some way to get the student to work around it um, one of the challenges I had was, you know, there were just too many choices because I had created so many different formats of things in preparation. Um, having that testing at the beginning to kind of uh, work the student through the different choices and, and have uh, uh, and engage with the different materials helped to select what types of things were most beneficial and then uh, able to pare those down for the, the future uh, weeks in the course. Um, also, I didn't have enough real data when I first started the course. In some ways, that was um, beneficial and that allowed me to bring in more of the real data that was relevant for the student. But it's something that I'd, I'd want to make sure and have to start um, in the future. Um, some changes I'd make, so make, I, I made the actual, the materials actually accessible. Um, so streamlining, including lots of relevant open data sets. So that's something that we also, uh, um, when we think about open educational resources, we're often t thinking about just the textbook. It was really important to also have open data for this course, you know, this is educational statistics course, it's high level course. We wanna actually use real data sets that are actually out there in the world that have the real issues that you encounter with, uh, with those data sets. Some of the lessons learned. Essentially, 
I was transitioning from going from universal design, so having lots and lots of different options and, uh, and directions that a student could go and select to more of a human-centered design, so making it a little bit more manageable for, for a student to actually navigate that universal design content. Um, making sure the materials were flexible and adaptable, and also making sure that I was flexible and adaptable. I had to change how I was approaching things. I had to change which technologies I was using, how I was using them. Um, but it, it was something that was very, um, very helpful to, to be able to change across the, the time. Uh, also to be able to accept that sometimes when you try out these new materials, they're not going to work. Uh, there were certain of the um, materials that I tried out that absolutely did not work. Uh, there were certain of the OER that I you know, converted over that just were more confusing than helpful. Um, learning from that, embracing it, and being willing to change it makes it so that you can really uh, get the most out of implementing OER. Uh, also, it, it just was very, very easy to include student research interests and, you know, just interests in general uh, and including that uh, student content and that student generated ideas in the generation of OER. And we'll be looking a little bit more at uh, at questions near the end, but I, I have my information, my contact information up here on the uh, on the PowerPoint, uh, terbunag, tbunag at pacific.edu. Um, with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Suzanne. All right, thanks Tara. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. All right, so, um, the, the this this piece ties in with what Tara was just talking about um, in that a course that begins with universal design gives some options for how to adapt um, pretty easily and so uh, what, what I'm going to look at is how you can use open content and open pedagogy as a way to build courses that are focused on universal design uh, a bit of a, a background on what the concept of universal design for learning is, it consists of three basic ideas. One is giving students choices in how they learn the information, so multiple means of representation. Um, giving students multiple means of expression and action is giving them options in how they demonstrate their knowledge. And then multiple, multiple means of engagement is giving students options in how they interact with the information. And the reason that this is really useful is that there, there is no such thing as an average or typical student, right? So the idea here is giving students the options to learn in whatever way works best for them. And when I say this, it often feels like um, this is just going to be mass chaos because there's so many options and so many different things going on. And so I want to start with just a, a, a kind of outline of what does not change, so where there are no options. And what there's not options about is what the students are learning. So the learning objectives for the course, those don't change. And we don't change the rigor of the course. So this is not about making the course easier. The idea being that the students are going to get to the same place in the end. It's just how they get there. That's the options that they have. So let's start with multiple means of representation. This is, um, this is something that I came to a few years ago when I was trying to decide which textbook to use in my course. And so I asked students to, to review a bunch of different books and, um, and after all of that input, I found that there was not a single textbook that was kind of the winner of the lot. Different students liked different books for different reasons. They really liked the examples or other students really hated the examples of the same book. And it started um, helping me realize that there was no best book for all of this. And um, oftentimes the book that I thought was best, like the one that I was really invested in, um, came out somewhere near the middle. So I realized, okay, maybe I'm, I'm not the ultimate arbiter of, of what is going to work best for each individual student. Uh, and also I was at that point participating in the writing of one of the early OERs for biology through Carnegie Mellon's um, Open Learning Institute. And 
we did a, a test in one of my classes where we gave students options of different book, of their book versus the traditional book, and looked at how, which one students likes and um, how they did in the course. And what we found is, again, students varied in what they liked and why they liked it. Um, and what was really interesting to me is students over the years, I've, I've kind of continued that survey, have been very um, uh, intentional in the book they choose and why they choose it. So it, it's actually kind of surprising how well thought through students um, are when they, when they choose what resources they use. So this is a, a slide showing a couple of the different examples that um, I use in my course to help explain the process of protein synthesis. It's one of the topics we cover. And you can see in the upper left is a paragraph from one of the open textbooks. Um, down below that is an interactive piece from a, a different open resource. Um, there's images that I found, and again, these are all open images that I bring into the course. There's videos. These are mostly on YouTube, but some of them are also uh, truly open. Um, and all sorts of other um, ways that students can learn the information. And so what I do is I create a list of all of the resources, everything from the textbook to kind of interactive and written links. You can see here Khan Academy is, is a big favorite for students, and YouTube videos. And so they get this long list of all the different options they have. And the question I always get at this point is, is that confusing to students? Because it's, it's this long list and they have to pick. And the reason it's not confusing is because I also give them along with that on the right side of the screen, um, a very clear list of what they have to learn. So this is, it, it's got all the terminology, it's got all, everything they need. And I tell them that's what you're focusing on. The resources are just how you're going to find the answers to those things. And one of the, the um, reasons that I find this has been really helpful, apart from just giving students the options of how they want to learn, is that it really starts teaching them a little bit about information literacy. So what I want to train students in is not so much, you know, learn everything in chapter three. It's here's a scientific question that you have where can you go to find good answers? Because my goal for, for this course, and this is a general education course, my goal is to help students know that in the future, if they have you know, something that they're talking about with their doctor, if there's something they're voting on, that they know where they can go to get good information. So I'm really focused on information literacy. Um, and as far as if this is confusing to students, I ask them, um, I survey my students all the time every week because this is um, generally in an online class is what I teach. And for, for the most part, out of 100 students, I only get one or two students that are, are confused by this sort of setup. And for those students, I tell them that the very first link in the list, that is the textbook. So that's the one I would have picked if I was to pick just one textbook. And at that point, they get it. So they, I said, ignore all the other links, and they're, they're good with that. But for the other students, when I ask them what they've chosen, um, they're, they're again focusing on, um, you know, I, they like videos because of whatever, or they like interactives. And so they, they really appreciate the option to find things that work well for them. So that's um, multiple means of representation. The next is multiple means of action and expression. And this is all about giving students options in how they demonstrate what they know. Now, in the box, just kind of for, well, let me back up. One of the concepts that we cover in our course is uh, uh, chemistry. So all the different chemicals of life and generally this, the structure of this lecture is there's four broad groups of chemicals examples of each and we talk about um, how, the, how the examples fit into the broad group. The terms that I would use in the lecture are all, over, all on the left side there. And on the right in the box is kind of how I used to test this. And this was, um, this was one of my favorite test questions because it really does require uh, some application and analysis. You know, so it's asking students to compare two different chemicals and look at the comparison between these four groupings and identify which grouping is different. Um, so it's a, it's a brilliant question, if I do say so myself, and it gave me lots of great data because the A students would get it right, the, the students that were struggling would not get it right, and so I thought I was all as well. 
the problem, and this came, uh, came up a few years in, is I was explaining the answer to the student and um, student said, well, what, but what does that dash mean? Like, what does that little sloped line mean? Is it, are you dividing the chemicals, right? And I realized that what this was really testing is their understanding of that framework of question, right? So those of us that, um, <laughs> those of us that have taken a lot of SAT tests are kind of familiar with what that design of question means, but the student, it, just didn't it didn't register as anything that made any sense at all so I thought all right well what I really want to know is do they know how these things are grouped and do they know what each of these things is and so why not just put that back on them and say all right you show me that you know how these things are grouped and what they are and that's that's kind of the extent of my instructions um, I tell them you know that's that's what I want to know how you show me is up to you and the students have come up with all sorts of really great examples of how they can demonstrate that knowledge. Um, so, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. The answer is, um, is, is C, because it's a, a example of not a smaller and larger. All right, <laughs> so, um, so the different ways that students have come up with, uh, with uh, to demonstrate this knowledge, you can see here up in the right hand is a, uh, a mind map. So here's the large group, here's a smaller grouping, here are all the groups within that smaller group, um, and this is just a corner of it. And you can see that they've also defined the terms to show me what each of these terms means. Up in the upper left is more of an outline form, um, but again, they can sh it shows that these are the smaller groups within the larger group of carbohydrate. They've defined everything. Um, flashcards are something that students really like, and so a lot of times I'll get pictures of flashcards or they might show a table. The bottom right corner is um, an online flashcard building system. And so one of the things um, that I encourage students to do is use online tools to help them learn this content. And the hope is that at the, um, at the end of this course, they've not only learned biology, but they've also learned study tools that they can carry on with them. And I, I get that comment a lot that giving them the option of these online tools has been really helpful. And of course, um, the course, uh, this question in the chat is what is the level of this course? It's a, a GE intro biology course for people that are not biologists and have never had a biology class. So that's kind of the level that this is for. So one of the really nice things about um, open resources, but also the, the, you know, the internet in general and all the free resources available, is that there's a lot of really wonderful tools that you can use for a variety of different levels of, of assessment. The downside is there's a ton of tools. And so I was getting really stuck in figuring out what is the best mind mapping tool, what is the best flashcard building tool, and so on. Um, and so I, I built a, a website, you can see the link up in the upper right, where I'm, I'm just for my own purposes, putting in um, all the links to the different types of tools that I like. And I'm hoping that, um, that so on this website also, I've included some, some rating tools. Um, I'm hoping that in, uh, as we all kind of look at these, if folks like some of them, they can rate them so I know. And that way we can start sorting educational tools that we as educators like. Um, better or, or lesser. Um, so in, in response to the Bloom's Taxonomy Pyramid, I didn't create that. Um, so it's down at the bottom, the citation here. It is really pretty. No, I, I wish I had. It's really nicely done. So yeah, so that that is multiple means of action and expression. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Hold on. That's it. All right, multiple means of engagement. So this is all about um, giving students different ways to, to interact with the material, kind of with the framework of um, interest level. So finding different ways to motivate students, because not all students are motivated by, um, by grades or by um, you know, other, other things. So giving them those options. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. This part really leans more on um, open pedagogy rather than just open resources. 
So the, the past two pieces, the reason all of that is possible is because there's all these open resources and free resources online, and that's really helpful. One of the, the best ways to engage students is to bring in the concepts of open pedagogy where they can start creating learning tools. So not just absorbing knowledge, but actually creating um, resources, which is a really empowering things for students. Um, and so one of the simple ways to do that is just with a, a review of resources. So in my course, I have that long list of learning resources that, that I showed you earlier. And one of the things I would like to do, I haven't quite gotten here yet because I haven't found the right tool for that job, is to have students evaluate those different resources. So right now I'm having them do that in a discussion in, in, um, in Canvas in the learning management system. But um, I, I'd like to build that up. But the idea is they're actually invested in the list of resources because they can talk about you know, which resource they like better, what it's missing, where they found that missing piece of information. And so right now we're doing that in the discussion format and it's working quite well. On the screen, what I have here is some other formats that I've been playing with. One is, you know, the Google has the, the plus one where you can start um, increasing, you know, showing which ones the students like better, or there's some various online tools for rate, rating and ranking systems. The next approach to getting students excited about material is what I call community service. And this came about because a lot of my students were looking up answers on things like Yahoo Answers and some of the other sites. And we're coming back with uniquely bizarre answers. <laughs> it's really the best I can describe it. Because these sites, you know, anyone can answer it and there's all sorts, it's all over the map as far as if they're gonna come back with, with any reasonable sort of answer. And so I thought, well, why not have students add to these sites? And so that's one of the assignments is, Go on to one of these sites, find a question, and answer it. Um, and what, what's really nice about this, again, it's all about empowering students to be kind of the masters of their own learning. They're not just passively learning things, they're actually adding to, to the, the external knowledge base. Doesn't have to be just answering questions. So a lot of my assignments have students creating things, creating images, creating tutorials, creating whatever it might be. And I encourage them to share that out on um, sites like Wikimedia Commons or some others. Now, for this piece, um, I, I don't require it because I don't, I don't think it's fair necessarily to require students to share out things that they've made if they don't want to. Um, but I do encourage it. And for the most part, students really do want to share what they've, what they've created. Um, they they feel more invested in what they've created and they feel they feel proud Especially when I call them out individually to say, you know, you've created this really beautiful thing Would you consider sharing it with the world so that other people can also? Benefit and I explain to them a little bit about licensing and that their name will always be associated with this resource um, and and that gives you know that gives them a chance to learn a little bit more about open as a concept even though it's not biology I do think it's it's important so that is a, a really brief um, foray into all the different ways that we can give students options in their learning. And the basic, the basic kind of take home message with this is it's really all about thinking about how, how different students are and how, how um, varied in approach and interests and creating a course that allows them to find their way into the content. That's kind of the, the main message there. And I think we have um, time for, for Q&A. Preston? Yes, um, if, if you wouldn't mind um, allow, allowing me to share my screen for a moment, Absolutely. we will have plenty of time uh, for some Q&A. So, sorry. So thank you very much, uh, Tara and Suzanne. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, before we do have questions, I just want to briefly mention 
that uh, the Open Education Conference, uh, the Global Conference, is uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there, hopefully. Um, the uh, Open uh, Ed 18 uh, Conference is going to be held in October uh, this year, and it is going to be in uh, in New York, um, overlooking the uh, beautiful Niagara Falls. Uh, and hopefully some folks will be able to attend that conference as well. Um, there's a lot more information on the CCCOER website under Get Involved, uh, where you can find some of these other uh, informations to these conferences and, and events that are happening. Uh, and please do continue to stay in touch uh, through the uh, email service that is offered. Uh, and the URL for that is listed on this page. Um, and lots more information is available at the cccoer.org website. Um, our next webinar is on May 9th, and that webinar will discuss the importance of student collaboration in OER projects. Uh, Brian Weston uh, from College of the Canyons uh, will be presenting, um, and hopefully you all will be able to uh, register and attend the upcoming session. Uh, and now, without further ado, I would love to open this up and get some questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone would like to uh, present any questions um, in the chat, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, and we would love to uh, get to some of these. Actually, and I, I, maybe I'll just jump in because I, I see some of the questions in the chat. As far as adding the um, the Learning Aids website to um, your library guide, that would be awesome. I, I would really appreciate kind of getting this out there so that that folks can start um, helping me build it to be as, as useful as possible. And there was a, a great question about assessment and that um, the question is, do we use rubrics? And Terry, you can answer as, as well. Do we use rubrics to assess learning? It seems like individualized learning would make it difficult. And how do we manage consistency in assessment? So yeah, the, the assessment is a, a, an entirely different approach when you're using um, this kind of, of um, demonstration of knowledge. One of the, uh, how should I say? So in some ways, it's a lot easier. Uh, and what's what's easier about it is I can get a holistic sense of what students know. So on a multiple choice test, right, you grade them on, um, well, I guess that's the easiest, <laughs> but I, I never really quite felt like I got a full handle on what students actually knew. With these types of assignments, I I have a better um, grasp of what they what they can show me. And what's been really interesting uh, as as far as for me as an instructor is, I'm also learning a lot about what they don't know, which has been super eye-opening. So I'm, I'm seeing some misconceptions and confusions that I'd never seen before because the, the traditional type of testing doesn't allow enough um, entry into kind of the realm of, of where students may be a bit gray. Um, so it's been, it's been really helpful as far as building in those teachable moments. But as far as the assessment, it's also, I do use a rubric and it's pretty linear. It, um, it asks, you know, did they define everything correctly and did they group everything correctly? So it's not that hard to grade. Yeah, I, I, I would, uh, from that, um, because I actually, I used the same rubrics as uh, had been used in the course previously. So that actually helped to ensure that the content and materials was still getting to that same, uh, meeting the objectives in the same way. Um, the, the rubrics and the guides that we were using did not actually specify what the format of that product needed to be in, uh, what it look, needed to look like and, and uh, and be like it needed to be of a professional quality and use the appropriate wording and things that that we would expect in a statistics course but nothing in it actually specified that it had to be something that was in a in writing or versus oral or had uh, had to be um, done in one particular way or had to be applied to um, one particular type of statistical data so that's it's kind of liberating <laughs> that that uh, is able to actually use the same uh, rubrics in the same way and be able to show that the student was 
meeting the same goals, just doing it through different um, modes of delivery and using different data. Okay, great. Uh, Tara, there is a question in the chat uh, that is directed specifically to you about um, how you provide accessibility for math components um, such as Greek letters and, and lookup tables. Do you have any insights to that? That was the hugest challenge of this entire thing and that uh, um, converting all of the text and explanations, definitions and content, um, that was very easy compared to converting the math, making it into something that was accessible. Um, the, um, there's actually a fair amount of, of uh, interesting research out there on, um, there's, a, there's a really excellent article I read on um, uh, teaching students who are blind in statistics. And this is, you know, obviously the, the big challenge. Um, and some of the things that I did was, um, I included uh, the graphics just as you would encounter it in the literature, along with a full explanation of what that uh, Greek letter meant. So for example, um, including the actual um, X bar, and then including um, an explanation that actually had X bar written out and then, you know, in words fully written out um, and an explanation of what it look, would look like and be like for somebody who was cited so that the student could connect uh, once, you know, when they're reading the literature, what they hear in the screen reader to what they actually, uh, what it actually means and how, and be able to use it. So that was, it was, it was hard to find something that was going to, to work best. Most of the, um, the, the Greek letters and different and equations, lookup tables and things, I actually converted into that uh, physical format because it was just, um, it's very hard to navigate those types of things with a, um, a screen reader. Some of the lookup tables, it was trying to determine whether, what was the, the essential lookup tables, so what things we, the student actually really needed to be able to pull from, and what things somebody in statistics would use a, you know, uh, a search. Uh, so limiting it down to what is actually truly essential. Um, and, you know, also providing excerpts from those tables where possible. Um, so that was, it was, it was a lot of uh, trial and error on that. That was probably the uh, <laughs> that was a lot of time involved. <laughs> yeah. So I, this is Preston and I have a question um, for both of you actually. And it's really just about um, both of you have, have undertaken some very interesting work. And I wonder if you are seeing any uh, sort of uptake in, in what you have done from others at your institution. You know, focusing on uh, what you've done, Tara, with with uh, accessibility, particularly you know for a visually impaired student, and, and how you've involved other students, and uh, with Suzanne and and the instructional design uh, process that that you have in place, is that something that uh, others are are following at your institutions? Um, I can I can I'll start. Um, I. So we're just starting to have those discussions here at, at Butte. It's, it's a different way to approach classes. And so I've, I've done presentations and a lot of folks have, have come to those and they seem interested. As far as redesigning their courses, that's gonna take some time. But what I have seen increases of is instructors that are altering assignments to give students more choices in how they, they complete those assignments. And I think that's a really good entry into this because it's the simplest process, right? So you have your assignment and you can kind of open it up and give students the options and how they want to, to answer it. As far as the giving students the options of different ways to learn knowledge, um, instructors are also starting to get into that. And I, I think a really great way to enter into that piece of it is 
we all have, I think, a list of resources that we use to help students learn the information, right? So kind of these ancillary videos and extra things. And it, it becomes really just a matter of thinking about making those extra things a, a part of the course and maybe a focus of the course rather than the textbook and then there's ancillaries. So it, it's a slow shift. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I've seen that happening with a number of instructors. Yeah, we've had a lot of different changes uh, regarding uh, both open educational resources and accessibility and the, and the combination of the two. Um, we have, uh, um, we're going to be entering our second year of a OER project here at University of the Pacific. Um, so we had a, a cohort of faculty who um, converted all of the courses to, to open educational resources. And then we'll be doing that again for the next uh, next school year and um, part of that has been inclusion of accessibility from day one within that uh, that context and uh, um, we also have uh, I work in our Center for Teaching and Learning here at University of the Pacific and we you know provide well uh, we provide workshops on uh, making materials more accessible. We made sure that our learning management system includes some accessibility checker tools. Um, just you know, providing a lot of things to make it so that it's a lot easier for for faculty to make things accessible, and also so that they can see how the the OER might uh, help to implement that, and and to also give them options for uh, universal design. So we've used a little bit of OER sometimes in. Uh, courses as a supplement um, so not just as a replacement for the textbook but as an alternative to the textbook so if students are, are not quite getting it with the textbook that's provided they can go back and look at the 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 OER uh, um, also for looking at the um, more simplified topics you know so if they're in an advanced engineering course and they need to look back at their um, certain of their math courses or something then we would make sure and include those OER the faculty are really interested in that aspect of, of OER. That's great. I know that accessibility sometimes uh, strikes fear in, in folks just because they know there are, uh, there, there's, you know, legal uh, a background that has set up a lot of these things. Um, but the reality is uh, it should be treated as an equity issue as with any other student and and getting past that initial fear. I think there's some really creative and important things that can be done. And, and, and I think you've demonstrated that uh, with with your work in your class. Uh, and I appreciate that. And, and I think in terms of the instructional design process that that uh, Suzanne showcased, I think that that is very useful for anyone. Um, and uh, I know that that's being that I have touched on both of those areas myself, I'm very happy to see these types of things being presented. Um, I would certainly like to open up and, and, and uh, invite any other questions from folks that uh, you may have for Tara or Suzanne at this time. I just also interested. like to, to note that uh, Barbara g gave a uh, link for the statistics and math symbols, and that's actually where I started with the explanations for converting the, the, uh, the text um, um, the English phrases into mathematics and mathematics back to English. Um, so that's, that's a really good source that she linked in the chat. Yes. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. So I think your presentations were, were so thorough and insightful that, uh, there's not a lot of uncertainty among our audience to, with additional questions, um, other than a lot of uh, uh, accolades and, and thank yous for, for, for both of you doing such a tremendous job. Yeah, I think, I think one thing is that uh, these types of things tend to uh, percolate for a while for people. So um, I know that uh, you know, our, our contact information is up on the screen, but yes, yeah, so I know that I, I'd be very uh, welcoming of any questions people may have. Uh, I know that once you actually start getting into this, there's always things that surprise you <laughs> about, you know, making the materials accessible and doing you know, checks and things like that. So I, I welcome any questions people have. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Um, I, I am more than happy to, to talk about any of these um, ideas with, with folks. 
Well, thank you both. And uh, for, for those of you who have joined us, um, there will be a recording uh, that will be posted uh, within the next 48 hours of this session. So I would encourage you to share uh, this with your colleagues and invite others to visit the CCCOER website and uh, check out a recording of this session if they were not able to attend. And I look forward to seeing you all at future uh, CCC OER webinars. And again, I would like to thank uh, both of you, Tara and Suzanne, for uh, your presentations today. They were very insightful, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.